Welcome to TCN Talks. The goal of our podcast is to provide concise and relevant information for busy hospice and palliative care leaders and staff. We understand your busy schedules and believe that brevity signals respect. And now, here's our host, Chris Como. Hello and welcome to TCN Talks. I'm excited. Our guest today is Kyle Lavin. Kyle is a doctor and MPH assistant professor of psychiatry at UNC Chapel Hill, and he is the chief clinical officer of Cerulea Care. Welcome, Kyle. It's so good to have you. Thanks. you. Excited to be here. So, Kyle, first off, what do you want our audience to know about you? Yeah, uh, I'm happy to, to share a little bit of my, my story, both on a, on a personal side and also on a professional side. I think like a lot of us in palliative care, I've, I've gotten into this work through some tough uh, personal experiences that have led me to be in here. And um, so on the personal side, um, unfortunately, I had a, a mom who had really bad scoliosis, um, had a family history of alcohol use disorder, and um, unfortunately had back surgery and in hindsight probably developed severe opioid use disorder. And so through my teenage years, I uh, was struggling with, with that. And I was uh, what I, I, I told this joke, it's not really a joke, on Wednesday when we were chatting, uh, that you know, I was a pretty good kid, I didn't rebel much, uh, but my dad was a psychiatrist, and I always said I was never going to be a psychiatrist. Uh, another thing I was going to do is that I was always going to cheer for the Tar Heels, even though he, I did all this training like Duke. So I'm still a Tar Heel, but obviously uh, I didn't hold the other rebellion because I ended up going into psychiatry. And uh, the reason for that is that I was a business major in an undergrad trying to fight that, uh, following in my dad's footsteps, and then... Uh, my mom ended up getting seriously ill and passing away between my junior and senior year. And so, you know, the, the vulnerabilities that come with that, and being my oldest son making decisions, my dad very supportive, but we separated. I just still clearly remember it. And there's a certain clinician who embodied the palliative care principles of being there, holding the space, allowing me to grieve, not making it about a decision, but making it about the process. And then other experiences that felt much more traumatic in nature all uh, really all uh, sort, of, sort of made it a real tough uh, experience. And so I hesitate to describe that as a crossroads, right? But that's where I decided I wanted to have that opportunity to help people that were born through that experience that, that I went through. And so went back to medical school, uh, did my psychiatry residency, had the opportunity to do my master's in public health on the, the timing of end of life discussions for terminal cancer patients. I uh, got my friend and mentor, Don Rosenstein, who introduced me to the world of palliative care via psychiatry. And so did my psychiatry training at Vanderbilt on um, sort of reflecting on my business background and my, my own personal experiences. So I'm looking at the landscape of, well, this is a problem. The mental health system is broken across the country, but a special serious illness where we know that the prevalence of these disorders gets much higher. Access is even more difficult as patients experience service fatigue. And so started thinking about how to address it from on population health level. And so we got really excited about the collaborative care model, about the ways to integrate behavioral health in serious illness care. I was lucky enough to go out to the University of Washington for my palliative care fellowship and pick the brains of the people that founded the collaborative care model out there, get a little bit of research on the impact of uh, behavioral health diagnoses on uh, acute care utilization at the end of life. Started thinking about how to apply it into the, the collaborative care model into the serious illness population. Came back to UNC uh, almost well, over eight years ago. I'm feeling feeling old. I've got some more gray hair and three girls now. Um, you know, I've been thinking about ways to implement this. And within the health system, it's been challenging because there are not very high margins. Building supportive care programs internally becomes really challenging. And so I had the idea to try and bring these collaborative care services uh, and it cost neutral to a slightly revenue generated way for uh, seriously ill patients and started oncology and things are going really well. So I'll, uh, that's, that's a lot of talking for me. So I, I'll wrap it up. One thing that just occurred to me and I, maybe I missed it. And Kyle just alluded to the fact that uh, the week that he and I are taping this, we had the amazing privilege of bringing him to our whole teleas. We call it our visioneering meeting where we have a lot of the CEOs and uh, the senior leaders and a lot of our TCM members. And I missed that one little quip about the palliative care person in your mom's care. And just what hits me, Kyle, is 
I'm all about cause and purpose. And that one person impacting you in such a way that you kind of foreswore off was, yes. where was that? Was that in North Carolina where you experienced the, the health care provider that in some respects, right, affected the trajectory of your life? Oh, 100% uh, affected the trajectory of my life. And, you know, I'm, I didn't even know about palliative care at that time. And so, honestly, I'm not sure if they were a palliative care provider. But, yeah, it was here in North Carolina. It was at Durham Regional Hospital. And I think it was just an intensivist who had the palliative care skills, but not actually sure that they had the official training. But, again, just like by being that human, by being embodying those skills and those communication principles, um, well, yeah, it did. It's, again, it seems cliche, right? But it did. It changed the trajectory of my life. My entire life shifted in one time. I don't think it's cliche at all. And just we've actually had a couple of circumstances on this podcast where kind of catching on that moment, um, we actually had an amazing guest, a lady named Judy Lynn Person. And I just, in a, in a whim, asked her that question. And I had this incredible moment, like she told this story, and she's well known in the hospice space. And I had this moment where I'm sitting there because I've spent a lot of my career in North Carolina as she was telling the story, I realized her trajectory actually created the pathway for the program I became a part of and did not realize that till end of the podcast. So kind of that whole cause and purpose thing and how the path kind of finds you uh, very providentially serendipity. It just, we, we bump into that all the time. So again, not to disclose too much personal information, but I'm not a super religious person, but it did feel like it was this like higher power of things leading me to a certain place. And uh, it's pretty special when uh, cause and purpose all up and you all be six experiences that lead you to the place where it feels like you're supposed to be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let, well, let's get into the topic, which is, you know, behavioral health, mental health. And I'm so thankful that we found each other. It was probably about two years ago, two CEOs who I immensely respect kind of looked at me in a very, it felt um, weighty way, <laughs> thoughtful way, weighty way, and said the mental health challenge is huge. And of course, the work we're doing, we're in the weeds with a lot of hospice and palliative care programs. I was seeing more suicide contracts I've ever seen before with patients, just seeing the challenges as team members are in IDGs. And, you know, everything in life is kind of a spillover. And when you get that spillover into end of life care of the challenges of mental and behavioral health throughout our country, it just really hit my radar screen. And I start reaching out. I probably have talked to five or six people and, um, should make you smile that like, I really camped out on you, Cal, because the work that you're doing. And um, I really was looking for a person also to help me understand the the general landscape, the ecosystem. And so you and I are going to get into all that. So let's first off, just talk, Kyle, you did a great presentation about the challenges in this space, mental health, behavioral health challenges that we're facing in our country. Can you share that perspective that you shared with our network? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the list of challenges is, is so long that it's, uh, it's hard to, to name them all out. But, um, you know, I think that the hardest thing is, is how siloed our current mental health care system is and how difficult it is for people with mental illness or a mental health diagnosis to access those services. And we have created a system where the onus is on the patient when they're experiencing depression, anxiety, feeling paralyzed by whatever is going on in that person's experience for them to be the ones to proactively go out and access. And so, you know, the, the standard of care right now is that you have someone who is seeing an oncologist, the oncologist notices that they have depression, they make a referral to the community to say you should go access a psychiatrist or a mental health provider. And the patient says, well, how do I do that? I, I don't know. Check the back of your insurance card. See what who's in network call and see if they're available. They call the the practice, they call the insurance company, they wait on hold for an hour or two, they figure out who's in network, they call the practice, the practice is full, it's a six month wait list. Um, and so, you know, I think the fact that uh, access to care is so challenging, when we put it, the onus on the patients in this vulnerable time uh, is a huge challenge. I think the other thing is that, um, you know, there's such a lack of providers and that we have all so some mental health providers, right? But we know that even in primary care, even when people who have resources, uh, then it's difficult for, for them to access it. But, um, you know, things, I, I think that even a lot of psychiatrists are really not comfortable with serious illness, with complex medical care. And so uh, they get really worried about taking care of those patients. And that, that leads into the conversation about 
how do we integrate behavioral health into serious illness and how do we make those decisions about when to sort of prioritize mental health and safety versus quality of life and end of life and you know, we could have a whole conversation about the, the ethics and the, the risks and uh, benefits of of those uh, sort of sort of analyses towards as people get more seriously ill. So a couple of follow-up questions that occurred to me, just thinking about our listeners. You covered this beautifully in your presentation that we had that we just alluded to, but what are the different types of providers, the different disciplines that are kind of involved in the delivery of behavioral health? Yeah. So, uh, you know, my background in training, right, you've got uh, psychiatrists who are focused on you know, the medical diagnosis, focused on the prescribing, certainly can be trained to do uh, some of the, the psychotherapy as well. And then we've got uh, psychologists who uh, go through and have uh, long sense of training that are really focused on therapy. And then you've got all sorts of different licensed clinical providers within the, the social work domain. You've got um, you know, marriage counselors, marriage therapists. And so you know, we've got all of these individual uh, clinicians that are trained in, in various ways that have their own skills and that there's just not enough of them to be able to, to get access to the to care that people need. You know, I, I didn't tell I was going to ask you this, but I recently <laughs> just really befriended this amazing woman who has a, an incredible program for autism, and it starts at the very young age and goes up. And I'm forgetting the discipline. There, there is it behavioral therapist? Does that sound right? Yep. And that that's a whole nother competency that I didn't know was out there. And it was just as fascinating to me of how they almost go down to to building blocks that many of us take for granted. But if that's not diagnosed early on, how it eventually might be misdiagnosed as some mental health challenges, et cetera. Does that, is, is it a behavioral therapist? Am I saying that right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, there certainly are behavioral therapists. And again, right, like we think about the licensed clinicians and, and that's one form of providers. But what I love about the collaborative care model is that uh, it takes non-licensed providers, right? And so you've got people who are trained in uh, they have a, a bachelor's in science and some sort of health related quality or health related field, and they become the person that's primarily interacting with the patient. So it expands the field of people that we can hire from immensely to be able to provide those services. And they, you know, we're also uh, using health coaches in our model, which is one of the fastest growing fields in healthcare where there is a, a year long certification process. But the health coaches are really trained in meeting people where they are understanding what motivates them, what the barriers are, helping them set what we call smart goals, which are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-bound goals to have them navigate and overcome the, the healthcare system. And so I think we have to be really creative about not being sort of set in our ways about the traditional way that we refer people to clinicians. They see a one-off in, in these solid settings that we need to build teams of the people that allow everyone to work to the highest of their ability. And so we've got, we don't need everyone to have 10 years of training. We need to have community support systems of people who are passionate and interested in trying to solve these problems, be able to hire them, train them to do the, the therapeutic interventions that they can do, and then create sort of a pyramid of supervisors and, and to all other, other specialists who can give those recommendations uh, to the patients and to the teams that are, are caring for patients. And that's brilliant on so many different levels. I mean, first off, you know, we've used the term quite frequently in our podcast, the silver tsunami, which is the aging of America, which is going to crash on shore. And we're already short of the typical disciplines that you see in hospice. So to hear you talk about that and the innovativeness and in that approach, um, that's, that's really amazing because that really does open up the pool of people, right? And, um, one thing that I wanted to go back on in just a second when I started off with the challenges of mental health right now, those challenges have always been there, but it feels like the volume of mental health issues. Do you think that COVID just, did it just expose what was brewing under the surface? Yeah. I mean, it, it is really scary to reflect on the increasing uh, mental health challenges that we're facing as a society. I think that the COVID exacerbated things and, and again, sort of reflecting on my own personal life of having uh, three daughters that are ages now and six and four and, and the child and adolescent uh, sort of epidemic of, of stress and anxiety and the way that social media and technology has exacerbated all of that. Uh, no, I think that um, you know, there, there are just so many pressures in so many ways 
that people are struggling while and the pandemic only sort of lit that on fire. And, and, and that's hard. But the good thing about that is that people are starting to recognize a little bit more that this is really necessary. We ought to address this. Otherwise, it's, it's really going to hold its back. Perfect. So um, you kind of alluded to this with the providers, but I originally asked you, um, <laughs> Kyle, I'm going to use this term, the mental health care system and kind of wink, wink. And maybe it's not, I shouldn't laugh because it's not funny at all. It's more of a, a patch, a patch quilt, whatever word you want to use. It's not, it's not much of a system, but can you, and I love you use the slide, it's called the ecosystem. And if you think it makes sense, we may actually use that in the show notes. Um, but can you just describe the ecosystem, the mental health system, the various flavors of entities out there trying to stand in the gap of this hugely challenging work? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that uh, it, it's hard to describe because it is so patchwork. But again, you've got the individual clinicians who are working in private practice, who have their standalone uh, well, clinics and programs that uh, the patients can access. And then uh, you've got the uh, inpatient psychiatric facilities that oftentimes are embedded within health systems. But, um, you know, I think that the way that the majority of people access mental health care in our country is through, unfortunately, the emergency rooms and through primary care. And those clinicians are trained in how to handle mental health crises. And so what I think happens is that we, we don't address things preventively and we can't access when people when people are struggling and have what we would call an adjustment disorder or they're just feeling overwhelmed, that's when we need to allow people to have access to the services that prevent them from getting more sick. And what we do is we've created a crisis response system, which is better than nothing, but people become acutely suicidal. They present to the emergency room. They end up boarding there for a week or two at a time. We make sure they're safe. Maybe they get a at an inpatient psychiatric facility and then they're at the inpatient psychiatric facility for a couple of weeks and we do our best to try and care for them. There's so many patients that it's not what I would call the most therapeutic environment. And so then they're discharged from those inpatient facilities and they end up sort of circulating back and forth through the process. And, um, you yeah. know, that that's not the the way that I envision uh, holistically addressing baby health uh, for, for people. And so, um, you know, there's other sort of digital health companies that are all uh, standing up in terms of trying to be able to improve access. And I think there's uh, a lot of power to that. I think there's the employee assistant programs where employers are starting to recognize how much mental health can, you know, again, I would love it if everyone was motivated because it was the right thing to do and people feel better, but they're recognizing that when people do have behavioral health diagnoses, that they're much less productive, they're much less likely to uh, show up to work, that they want them to be able to generate as much money. And so I think employers are starting to integrate behavioral health programs to try and uh, be, get a little bit more in front of it, and not just be that crisis response. Yeah, that's that's very well said. Um, I think I was thinking I'll go here at the end, but I think I need to go here right now. There's, there's, it's really hitting me listening to you earlier this week and now that you and I are doing this podcast. You know, there's generally been this stigma um, around mental health. It's, you know, the greatest generation. Um, it's funny, one of our, uh, one of the CEOs in the group, we were talking in a breakout group after your presentation and she used her maiden's name. I'll, I'll make it up. My last name is Como. It, the Como way is basically pull yourself up by your bootstraps and we don't talk about emotions. Yeah. It does feel like the times are a changing. And yes, there's been this stigma about mental health. And which really gets me excited about this work that you're doing. Um, certainly in hospice, it was embedded in our model from the get go on the bereavement and grief side, and of course, having social workers. Yeah. But, but you know, it's still limited in the level of expertise and competency. We were kind of advanced at the hospice where I grew up. We actually had a psychiatrist on contract. Oh, wow, um, amazing. We had an amazing chief medical officer who was just brilliant. Um, I remember at the time going, huh, why are we doing that? But she was just all about patient and family needs. And so she was probably one of those early pioneers uh, seeing the need for that. So can you just talk about the stigma a little bit? Do you think the times are a changing, which makes your, like you're arriving at the perfect place at the perfect time? Yeah. You know, I, I do think that they're, they're slowly changing. Uh, and you know, what's interesting to me and I, I loved how uh, when we were talking on Wednesday, we, we sort of compared it to the, the palliative care experience and there was the whole conversation about 
how are you introducing this to patients? Are you mentioning that this is psychiatry or this is behavioral health? That makes me think of all, uh, you know, in palliative care, right? Or do we call our services all uh, supportive care services or can mm-hmm. we actually use the word palliative care and are our patients going to respond to that? And, um, you know, I think in palliative care, we've come uh, a long ways. I think we've moved a lot faster than we have in, in, in behavioral health. And, you know, palliative care has only been around for 20 years. Mental illness and psychiatry has been around for, I don't know the number, but more 100 years uh, or so. And that um, it's taken so long for people to recognize the need. And again, I think part of it is the American culture, right? Pull, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The more you talk about it, it shows vulnerability, it shows weakness. Um, and I do think that uh, hopefully we're getting to a point where people are more open to talking about those things, more open to accessing those services, uh, and, and that we can maybe bring the patchwork quotes and system to a little bit more of a cohesive uh, integrated system. Yeah, I, I truly do. I mean, I really have come out of this week more hopeful, not that it's going to be next week, but and the analogy you just drew uh, that we bumped into our time together of because I can remember sitting around the table in 2002 and going, we're going to do powder care. What is that? And just seeing how far the field has come and how we've struggled with what is the right lexicon, the right words. And just for our listeners, one example, when we're having this discussion with Kyle prior to the show is one of our members who's doing a really interesting program with LCSWs um, partnered with their powder care program and they're doing some billing and the patient got an EOB, which is the explanation of benefits. And on there, um, Kyle, you probably have the, I think it said, uh, was it a psychiatric eval? Was that what the word was? Yeah, exactly. And then it, older generation gentlemen just basically freaked out. Are you saying I'm crazy? And, and he saw it on the bill. So therein lies what we're poking on here about the stigma and navigating yeah. that and what's the, what is the right words. And even if we figure out the right words on talking to them, then the EOB comes to their home and, and torpedoes this hard work that we've done of using the right words with them. So there's all yeah. problems to be solved as we go forward. And we've had that, that same experience in Cerula Care where we, we have, uh, you know, we're early on, we've all served just over a uh, hundred members so far, but we had one member who, was greatly benefiting from the service and was well, improving significantly. But then we diagnosed them with an adjustment disorder. And when they saw in their chart that they had been diagnosed with an adjustment disorder, their whole reaction was, I'm not crazy. Why, how do you think, why do you think I'm crazy or I have a diagnosis? And it's like, well, you're, you're benefiting from this. And the fact that you've been labeled with a diagnosis is going to prevent you from accessing the care that is making you feel better. Um, you know, so yeah, so we're yep. making progress, but it's still there. Maybe you and I could go fight the EOB because I'm sitting there thinking. I, I think I mentioned to you one of the first times I was mentored by Stephen Covey's mentor, gentleman, and Dr. Lee Thayer. And when you do put those labels right, there is something about that. And you could think maybe could they not just blind that part of the EOB? Um, because it it that was pr- that's probably going to be a problem that is going to continue to haunt. So just simply just blind those codes. Why does the patient need to know the code? They can yeah. see the dollar amounts or something. That might be a simple solution. Just blind that part. Totally. Or what you uh, you brought up on Wednesday, right? The the term what we're sufferologists, or you mean? So yes. it's, uh, you know, I think that's worth talking about. You can share your perspective on that. But what in my mind, right? Like, why do we need to label it? Why can't why do we, why do they need to see anything? But why can't it just be like patient needs help? Patient yes. wants this support. Patient benefiting from this role. Like we yeah. don't need to label a diagnosis and perpetuate the stigma. Okay. We're not yep. there. Yeah, what Kyle's alluding to is that we had a presentation from another brilliant physician a couple of weeks ago, and he used a term that just like for all of us, it was like a brain tattoo. And it was this whole conversation was, what do you call the powder care person? And they're like, we're sufferologists because we're here to relieve suffering. And I'm like, oh my God, that is brilliant. And there's so many different forms of suffering. The work that you're doing, Kyle, is one form of that. What our powder care team is doing, and of course, if we transition them in hospice, and so it really is to relieve suffering. So, yeah, I love that. Tell me about innovations that are going on in this whole space of behavioral health and maybe opportunity to talk about what you're doing. Totally. Um, no, I think that there, there are a lot of neat things that are that are happening in terms of innovations. Um, we'll start with what I'm doing. You know, that I'll think that there's a certain sort of beauty and the simplicity of, of using the collaborative care model. And again, when we think about access to care and the licensed professionals, I can get as many people to 
be able to have access to these services as possible. You know, the collaborative care model is wonderful because you're able to have these unlicensed professionals who are able to um, see the patients, be the direct one in their own think about the uh, specially trained uh, psychiatrists that, like myself, I'm one of less than 100 palliative care psychiatrists. There's so few psycho-oncologists and there's so many people that need help. And so if you're able to take a typical psychiatrist who sees 200, 250 patients and uh, increase the access and happen to see 2,000 to 3,000 patients, then I think that makes a huge difference. And then, you know, one of the things that I think is really scary to us, and I'd love to hear your thought, but I think is a huge opportunity, is the use of artificial intelligence. And it's a huge buzzword, um, mm-hmm. but I think that we need to be really thoughtful about how we use that. And if we've got limited access to certain people, can we use large language models and machine learning to be able to recognize patterns that we say, you know, that this person has this experience and has these characteristics and that these, you know, 100 palliative care psychiatrists, when we've analyzed the data and make these recommendations, can we create sort of prompts to be able to have, whether it's a nurse practitioner or someone that doesn't have the same level of experience, be able to give that expertise or give those recommendations to patients, you know, we're we're exploring opportunities for that and thinking about with our health coaches, right? That we've got all of these tools and all of these things that we know can be helpful. We want every patient member interaction to be organic, to be driven by the therapeutic alliance. And at the same time, if we can give AI informed nudges to be able to give prompts so that we know that the most therapeutic intervention is being delivered, then that, um, you know, there's two opportunities where we can improve scale and access when we can improve the the efficacy of the interventions we build. So, um, you know, in terms of what we're doing, that's what I'm excited about. Uh, and, and, you know, just using telehealth and digital technology and, uh, you know, improving access to care. Um, we need to make sure that people do have access to, uh, you know, the internet and the technology to be able to, to use telehealth. But uh, I think there's a huge benefit of that. What are, what are your thoughts on uh, artificial intelligence? I love that you asked that. And what, uh, um, have you ever bumped into Lyra, L-Y-R-A? What? Yeah. So, um, so you probably know where I'm going with this. And so I, and I'm guessing just by watching, cause we actually got a demo. I can't remember what, how we bumped into them, but for some folks just, it's kind of like Google's, um, employee assistance program. But yeah. what I kind of think is there's two things. Number one, they have this incredible credentialing process and they have this, um, plurithera of different types of therapists that you could bring to the table, even different modalities. And then on the front end, the patient does via their kind of access to the EAP portal, kind of what's going on. And they basically connect them. So I got to imagine there's some artificial intelligence with that intake process that's creating like a little bit of a matchmaking service. And so, and we've got a demo and I was pretty impressed by what I saw actually. So I do think, and you know, artificial intelligence is moving quickly I have two minds about the whole thing. I've grown up in hospice. It's very high touch. It's very sacred work. But I know this. I'm an accountant by trade. We have a math problem. There's going to not be enough people compared to patients. So we're going to have to figure out how do you blend technology to get the staff at the right care at the right place at the right time. It strikes me that's exactly what you're working on, um, just in a different, whole different area. And it's interesting, Kyle. I had an experience just in the last week, and I can't remember exactly what made me do it. But I was on a call with an attorney and a pretty complicated conversation. So I opened up chat GPT and I started asking it and it was basically saying what the attorney was saying, but what it helped me do is ask the attorney a much more complicated question, like getting beyond the deterministic, what the law is to here's the real problem I'm trying to solve. I just sat there amazed at that whole conversation. And I'm like, yeah, I'm becoming much more of a believer of how you use AI to do your job much more effectively. Yeah. I mean, again, I think we're on the, the same page and we haven't talked about this before, but I do, I have very mixed feelings. Like it feels in some ways against the whole ethos of going into medicine and in hospice were very high touch and the whole Hippocratic oath of do no harm and we're here to serve our patients. And like to think about it being done by technology and not that we're talking about like, robots doing it, and not interacting with people at all, but uh, that's scary. But you know, I think it's, I think it's coming. All can be do it in a way that is um, you know, therapeutic and beneficial for patients and all. Uh, love to be a part of it. 
Well, let's poke on maybe two things. I love the fact that you framed it as an innovation. Us hospice people are kind of smiling, like we kind of think we invented the interdisciplinary approach, <laughs> you know, because you know, hospice goes back to 1983. And the older I get, almost 30 years now in this work, it is a brilliant model. Yep. Now, now you see, I mean, it's challenging, right? You bring multiple professionals and how does each person have the need to know? So that way you deliver, deliver as much of a seamless experience as possible. And so do you feel like you guys have cracked that nut or learning every day of how you really do deliver that interdisciplinary approach? Yeah. I mean, no, I don't, I don't know if it's a nut that can be cracked, but again, I think that's an example where, you know, being able to do things remotely and being able to do things on zoom or teams, uh, allows people to, to all come together. And so, you know, we, we try our best to be very clear in terms of the, the roles and responsibilities in terms of understanding what people are supposed to be working on, creating protocols and frameworks to be able to make sure that we're, we're triaging and, and getting people to, to bring the the most salient information uh, into those interactions so that it can be done quickly and efficiently. But where have you cracked it out and you're hiding it from me? Is that where uh, where this is going? <laughs> no, 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 not, I, I wish I would. And actually it's interesting, even TCN as a model is an interdisciplinary approach. We're delivering it to organizations. And so we're living it, we're also coaching it. Um, you know, even hospices that have done IDGs for years, that's whenever you do the interdisciplinary group, you review the care plan. It's just so easy for human beings to fall into the task mode and lose the systemic thinking, critical thinking. Hey, this is a great opportunity for us to know what really matters most. What's the problem that we're trying to solve? And so having someone in a coaching capacity, um, because there is no perfect system, but someone thinking more critically to kind of poke people a little bit to think more critically, that's probably the closest I'd say to cracking the nut is just using that so people don't fall into screensaver mode. Um, I've sat through many an IDG in my years and that gravitational pull is there and, yep. and just the human ability to sit there and pay attention. So the yep. other the other innovation I want to poke on, Kyle, was the telehealth aspect. And so yep. do you think that um, first off, the uptake and acceptance, are, are you a little bit better positioned for telehealth? Do you think in the behavioral health space, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, again, that, that was one of the uh, we talked about many negative things that came out of COVID and, and how that sort of exacerbated so much of the mental health crisis. But I do think what it did do is it, it forced the legislature and the insurance companies and, and all of us as providers that then we had to work remotely and we had to figure out how we can do this and how we can go for this. Um, and I think it's, it's been um, you know, much more accepted. I think that people seem to respond really well to it. There have been some neat all. Uh, Studies coming out in palliative care when you look at Jennifer Temple's group and comparing sort of standard in person palliative care to tele palliative care and, and showing that uh, it's just as effective. And so, um, you know, I think that it can can really be effective. And what we don't want to do is and again just rely on that and lose out on that human connection and make sure that we're not. That's not the only way that we're seeing people. But uh, in our experience with what we're doing with cerebral care, that uh, patients are still getting remarkable responses that, you know, depression is decreasing by an average of 60% over four months with just this virtual model. When we're tracking the, the FACT G7 in terms of a quality of life measure and that quality of life is improving by 60% over three months. And so a lot of the care that we do, I would say I mean, close to 50% is actually just by telephone, right? And so like wow. that, that is not technologically advanced but it does allow people to stay at home. And I think it's so important, right, when they've got a serious illness and they already have this sort of service fatigue of all these appointments that feel crummy for more chemotherapy or their chronic illness or their shortness of breath, to, to try and ask them to come into a separate mental health appointment oftentimes makes things worse, right? And so we can bring the care to people where they are using technology. I think it's important. Yeah, that's great. Well, Kyle, you alluded to the collaborative model. I think that'd be probably worth just explaining a little bit more because the more that I get to know you and the work you're doing, man, that's really part of the special sauce that I think you're bringing to the table. Totally. Yeah. The, uh, the collaborative care model, again, founded out at the, the University of Washington, basically takes a behavioral health care manager. Traditionally, uh, they'll work in primary care where they're embedded either in person or virtually with the primary care physician. 
the behavioral health care manager becomes the primary point of contact uh, with both the primary care physician, but also with the patient. They are screened and identified as having depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance use disorder, you know, uh, various mental health conditions that, that we can treat. And then they're referred to that program. And over time, you know, a behavioral health care manager delivers what we call brief psychotherapeutic interventions, primarily focused on problem solving therapy, right? So rather than the typical traditional psychodynamic, let's discuss the childhood and everything we've experienced, sort of dig deep into what's going on, it's more about being focused on the present. How can we address what's causing you distress in this moment? And then We've also trained our care managers to use uh, the types of therapy like acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, behavioral therapy. And then what they do is that they do these standardized assessment tools. And so PHQ-9 for depression, GAD-7 for anxiety, and they upload that in your registry. And again, talking about using technology, you know, the collaborative care model is measurement-based treatment to target. So we're tracking these outcomes of the tall. Seems simple, but in behavioral health, so often it's subjective. All of our diagnostic criteria are subjective based on what people are reporting. We say, oh, are you feeling better? Whereas oh, I think I'm better, but we don't actually change our treatment poems quickly enough because we don't have ways to measure it. So all of this information is uploaded into a registry that allows us to risk stratify patients based on if they're not getting better. After three months, let's talk about it. Let's change the medication. Let's change the intervention. If they get worse over a month, we can we can change it. Um, and then the, they meet in the interdisciplinary groups virtually with our psychiatrists. And all of I mentioned with the health coach as well. Um, and the psychiatrist is able to to give that recommendation to give to go back to the typically the primary care physician. And what we're doing is the embedding with anthologists stay and. I'll pause for a second. I can talk a little bit about the health coach, which I think is another yes, please. novel thing that we're doing. Um, you know, the the health coaches um, are focused on on the wheel of health, as, as we call it. And so um, there's such close interplay between behavioral health diagnosis and health and wellness. But in our medical system, unfortunately, we over medicalize. Oftentimes, we forget that this holistic wellness is just as important, oftentimes, as the actual medical diagnosis. It won't stand it. So. In terms of the wheel of health, there's the practical bucket, there's the emotional bucket, there's the relational bucket, and then there's the physical bucket. And depending on what's most important to people, we may be helping them with basic things like nutrition, like exercise, like their relationship with a higher power. How do I, there's so much social isolation now, especially after COVID and, and, and things get better. Like, how do I build my social network? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. And some of the feedback we've gotten from the patients we're working with and things like, you know, this is the first time people have asked me what brings me joy. This is the first time people have asked me what's important to me as a person. Uh, and again, I'm preaching to the choir, the palliative care group, like we're all doing well, but well, I'm not, no shade on oncologists. You guys are great, but oftentimes they're trained in just focusing on the, the diagnosis, right? Yeah. So to be able to bring off two more but to kill is, is real, well, something I'm passionate about. That's great, man. Well, Kyle, you have the year of a lot of hospice and palliative care people. Um, I could see a lot of potential partnerships on the palliative care side. Final thoughts you'd like to share with them. And at the end, I'm going to make sure whatever you want us to include, your email address, it's really is um, email, uh, email account or um, your website, all of that stuff's going to be in the show notes so folks can get connected with you. Yeah. I mean, I can just say in, in my final thoughts are, well, first of all, thank you to you, Chris, for having me on here for putting together this network of people and incredible thought leaders within the field. Uh, and I think that I'm, I'm really passionate and I truly do believe that this is a huge problem, but we can sort of disrupt the status quo, right? That this has been a fragmented, siloed mental health care system for a long time. But if we get thought leaders like yourself and like others to advocate for the need for integrating behavioral health into these serious illness services, whether it's palliative care, oncology, nephrology, you know, homology, but, uh, I think that we can really revolutionize the way that we address mental health care in our, in our health system and that uh, not only will patients do better, but uh, our providers will have less burnout 
um, we'll have more job satisfaction. So those are my final thoughts. Yeah, I'm looking. You you and I are going to remain friends because I'm very looking forward to watching the great work that you guys are doing. And um, again, two good friends really kind of turned me on to, hey, are you kind of aware? And of course, I was seeing the spillover effect of this challenge, but knowing an incredible organization like yours is kind of being birthed to be great partners with us. It makes me pretty excited about the future. So thank you for what you guys are doing. I appreciate that. Well, to our listeners, we always leave you with a quote, something that a more thought provoking quote. Um, and so this is one that Kyle and I kind of picked together. There are actually two, cause I couldn't get down to one. So this one's from Nito Quibane, a wonderful guy who's at um, High Point University in North Carolina, incredible speaker. He says, your present circumstances don't determine where you go. They merely determine where you start. And this last one, it's not the bruises of the body that hurt. It's the wounds of the heart and the scars of the, on the mind. That's from Asha Mirza. Thanks for listening to TCN Talks. Thank you to our TCN Talk sponsor, Dragonfly Health. Dragonfly Health is also the title sponsor for April and November 2024 Leadership Immersion courses. Dragonfly Health is a leading care at home data, technology, and service platform. With a 20 year history, Dragonfly Health uses advanced technology and robust analytics to manage durable medical equipment and pharmaceutical services as part of a single efficient solution for caregivers, patients, and their families. The company serves millions of patients annually across all 50 states. Thank you, Dragonfly Health, for all the great work that you do.